wow. That's it. That's the review. I'm just kidding. So Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse came out last week. The sequel, which is actually a part two of what is going to be a trilogy, which I think a lot of people didn't know going into it. I've seen a lot of people online that um, when the cliff, the sort of cliffhanger ending happens, um, they were shocked. They were like, what, what happened? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is a part two. Uh, it's, I guess it's technically not a trilogy. It's part one of a two-part ending. So it's part one of the sequel. Uh, they just split the movie. I guess it was a really long movie, so a really long part two. So they split it into two. Beyond the Spider-Verse is going to be coming out next year in March. Can't wait for that. But Across the Spider-Verse came out last weekend. And I mean, I just got to say up front, it might be the greatest comic book movie of all time. If we're just talking movies based on comic books, uh, I don't know a movie that's did, done it better than this, to be honest. And um, definitely, if it's not the best, at least top five for sure. And definitely top two um, of greatest Spider-Man movies of all time. Um, I would, I would kind of go back and forth between Across the Spider-Verse and Spider-Man 2 the Sam Raimi, Tobey Maguire, Doc Ock one. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, definitely top five in both of those categories. Top three, in, in my opinion, or top two for Spider-Man. But uh, across the Spider-Verse, I think it's definitely, it's definitely the best multiverse movie that we've gotten so far. It did everything that I think we thought and we had hoped that Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was going to do. Um, that ended up kind of being sort of a letdown, that movie. Um, as far as the multiverse goes, uh, they could have done so much more, but they really only focused on the two universes. This one really fo really expands uh, the Spider-Verse um, and shows, it really goes, you know, it goes across the Spider-Verse, <laughs> for, for a, a lack of a better term. And you get to see uh, Pavita, you know, who's Spider-Man India, which they're relaunching that title, um, I think, this upcoming week, actually. Uh, so check that out if you liked uh, Pavita, Park, uh, Pavita and um, the Spider-Man India in the movie. They're relaunching his title. Um, they show you Nueva York with Spider-Man 2099, who we talked about last week. Um, and I really like how with Spider-Man 2099, Miguel O'Hara... They really leaned into kind of the vampire aspects of him. I kind of talked about I talked about that in uh, my explanation of who is Spider Man twenty ninety nine. How he's kind of basically like a vampire Spider Man, and uh, uh, Miles actually makes a um, a joke about that, like a, a vampire good guy. I'd love to see that, which was a callback to um, you know Sony made the Morbius movie, which did not do well. <laughs> But uh, Morbius is kind of a vampire good guy, and so that was kind of a joke, a little jab, because um, Sony made this movie, obviously, and they made Mo the Morbius movie, so it's kind of a little jab at that. And um, but yeah, they, I, I really loved how they leaned into the kind of the darker, more vampire-y aspects of Spider-Man 2099. He was brooding. Um, he was um, more serious, and they even at one point was going to use his venomous fangs to bite uh, the... Um, the vulture from the other universe, the part, the kind of paper parchment vulture that they were capturing at the beginning. So I really liked that. Um, I loved uh, Pavita. I really loved Hobie, uh, Spider Man or Spider Punk, um, who I really hope they, uh, they're, well, they're definitely going to, uh, I think, expand his role in the second part. Well, they, although the second part I think is mostly done, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know how much more they can expand his part on, but you know his reception, at least from fans and from people who aren't familiar with Spider-Man, he had a really great reception from uh, you know the internet and fans as a whole. So uh, hopefully, maybe we'll get like a spinoff of Across the Spider-Verse where they can go more into these characters. I know that I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, I don't want to say that because I can't remember exactly. But, um, yeah, so hopefully they do some spinoffs because uh, I know that they said this is the end of Miles. That uh, part three will be the end. Beyond the Spider-Verse will be the end of Miles 
story in the Spider Verse. Uh, they're obviously they're going to make a live action Miles movie, but uh, even if it's the end of Miles' story, I would really like to see them spin this off. You know, usually spin offs are a bad thing, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of potential with this movie to kind of showcase these characters a little bit more. Yeah, Hobie was great. Uh, Pavitar, Spider Man India was great. Spider Man 2099 was great. Uh, Gwen really had a more expanded role. This was just as much Gwen's story as it was Miles' story. And I really like that they kind of um, had more moments with for it to kind of uh, expand her character and, uh, you know, show kind of what makes her tick. Um, there was a, there were a lot of character moments in this movie, actually. I think that's one of the things that makes for a really good comic book movie because movies based on comic books, I've said this before, but I think probably, there's probably 50 to 100 stories, comic books, at least the, you know, the DC, Marvel, the mainstream comic books, as we know them, uh, have been around for about 80 years. And, um, the, basically when, uh, when Superman, when Superman became, um, mainstream, that's really what, what started the golden age in comic books. So since the golden age has been about 80 years and in those 80 years, there's probably been maybe 50 on the high end to a hundred, um, runs or stories in comic books that would actually make sense and make to make a movie or a TV show out of uh, in those 80 years. <laughs> and the rest of it is just really dumb uh, stories, for a lot of fun stories, but a lot of things that wouldn't make for good movies or TV. But, um, but, and a lot of the more, the ones that would make for better movies or TV have happened more recently in those, then, you know, way back early in the golden age <laughs> and early silver age. But the, one of the things that makes for a really great comic book movie, um, even though a lot of comic books can be a lot of fluff or a lot of fun or a lot of just dumb, you know, slice of life type stories. One of the things that you can do to make the a movie based on comic books more, um, uh, more watchable is, and not, you know, by the numbers is character having character moments and developing the characters. A lot of movies are afraid to have those um, slower moments where they just sit with the characters and the characters are talking or explaining, um, you know, how they feel about different situations. A lot of movies are afraid to do that. They just want to have action, action, action. You know, they want to be like the how the Fast and the Furious movies are kind of now, even though they do kind of have small character moments in those sometimes, but nothing like um, what's in Across the Spider-Verse, really. They really like when Miles and Gwen are upside down on that building and they're just talking and it's just like long establishing shots of the, of New York and them looking at each other talking. Uh, when Miles just had that conversation with his mom, uh, that could have been really dumb. They could have just, you know, had him joking through it. But then they do tell jokes, but um, they take time to have these character moments with uh, Miles and the people that are close to him to kind of develop his character. And they do the same thing with Gwen as well, which is something that these uh, Across the Spider-Verse movies do really well. Uh, the producers, uh, Lord and Miller, they are really good at uh, having, you know, they're really good at these character moments and developing characters and turning, um, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, moments you know, things that are kind of average into uh, greatness, like the, uh, like across the spider verse, you know, it, it is, there is a lot of action. There's a lot they throw at you. You know, they flip through scenes like comic book panels. There's a lot of colors that they play with, you know, Spider-Man 2090 or not Spider-Man 2099, uh, Hobie, spider punk, you know, they said it took them two years to animate him because there's different frames you, you, you know, you saw him flashing. Every um, part of him is animated at a different frame rate. So <laughs> there's a lot to this movie, a lot of, you know, visual stimulus. But uh, there, so it could have just been a big, you know, spectacle. 
kind of like how that's kind of how I feel about Multiverse of Madness, Dr. the Doctor Strange movie. It's kind of a spectacle, and there's not a lot of character moments. And um, but you know, this is not to you not know, you know not to drag on other movies. You don't need to drag on stuff to build this up. But I mean, this really is what you know you kind of expect from a multiverse type of movie. And speaking of the multiverse, they really do a good job, like I said, of connecting all the different, you know, connecting the Spider-Verse. We got to see uh, different moments of other Spider-Man characters from the past, like Toby with Uncle Ben. We got to see um, Andrew Garfield with um, Captain Stacy. We got to see Tom Holland, Spider-Man in this movie. We got to see Donald Glover's Prowler in this movie, which um, if you're not familiar with the Donald for Spider-Man campaign, uh, that was something that happened in, I believe it was, you know, 2010-ish, 2011-ish, right when they were trying to cast for the Amazing Spider-Man movies, which the casting ultimately went to Andrew Garfield, um, Donald Glover had a campaign. This was way before, this was when he was just starting out as Childish Gambino. You know, he was on Community. He wasn't as big as he is today. He didn't have the, you know, the Grammys and all the albums. He was just starting out, you know, just starting to become very popular and mainstream. He was on Community, which was the show that kind of shot him into, uh, stardom. But, um, when that movie, when they were casting for Amazing Spider-Man, which ultimately went to Andrew Garfield. Donald Glover had a, there was an internet campaign, which was a hashtag Donald for Spider-Man. And he didn't end up becoming Spider-Man, but he was really pushing for it. And fans on the internet were pushing for it. Um, I was like a junior in high school at that time. So I, I vividly remember the internet, you know, buzzing for, you know, Donald as Spider-Man and Donald Glover as Spider-Man. And, even though he didn't end up getting the part, the whole Donald for Spider-Man campaign is what the creator of Miles Morales says inspired him to create that character. As you know, Miles Morales, um, he was created in the uh, the Ultimates universe, which is coming back now. We're, I'm going to make a video on that later <laughs> later on, but uh, they're bringing the Ultimates universe back, which I am don't know if I'm a fan of, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but Miles Morales was created in the Ultimates universe. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's, uh, the Ultimates universe gave us a lot of um, interesting things. <laughs> Miles, I think Miles was one of probably was the best thing to come out of the Ultimates Universe. Um, the Ultimates Universe also gave us uh, Nick Fury in the style of Samuel L. Jackson, which ended up leading to him becoming cast as, um, Sam as Nick Fury in the MCU. So a lot of interesting things came out of the Ultimates Universe. One of them was Miles Morales. And uh, the creator of Miles Morales credits the Donald for Spider-Man campaign as the inspiration for Miles Morales. And even some of the earlier drawings or depictions of Miles Morales had similarities to Donald Glover um, at the time, kind of like how they did Nick Fury had a lot of similarities similarities to Samuel L. Jackson, although he looked a lot more like Samuel L. Jackson. He kind of looked almost exactly like him. Uh, Miles Morales doesn't quite, didn't quite look like Donald Glover, but he was definitely the inspiration for him, according to the creator. And so it kind of came back full circle in this movie. Uh, well, originally in uh, Homecoming with the, you know, the Tom Holland movie, uh, the first Tom Holland Spider-Man movie, he was the Prowler and he kind of mentions his nephew. Well, he wasn't the Prowler. He is a person that's that Tom Holland Spider-Man meets and he mentions his nephew. Um, and so, you know, obviously that was a wink, wink, nod, nod that he is might be Uncle Aaron. And so now in Across the Spider-Verse, we get to, we got to see you know, kind of the fulfillment of Donald Glover in the Spider-Man universe, even though he's not Spider-Man, he um, was the prowler in that, you know, sort of, you know, containment thing. And he got to see uh, the, his, the inspiration for this character, you know, face to face. <laughs> and so I thought that was a really great coming around moment for that whole thing. And for the character of Miles Morales, since he was basically inspired by, you know, Donald Glover, Childish Gambino. And so it was really cool to see both of them meet 
uh, meet. <laughs> and uh, hopefully in the live action Miles Morales movie that's supposed to come out, um, Donald Glover will get to play the Prowler, um, Uncle Aaron, in that movie as well, since, you know, they're, he's now in the Spider-Verse fully as the Prowler. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these things, they can be seen as, you know, a lot of these, what you could call them cameos, um, they could be seen as kind of cheap and fan service. And so a lot of the times that does happen in movies where it's a lot of fan service, wink, wink, nod, nod, things like that. But I think they did a really good job of every every cameo had a place in the narrative of the movie. Uh, you know, when Spider-Man 2099 is explaining canon events, which I thought was a really great way to um, to um, have the conflict in the movie explained as canon events. Because if you know comic books, canon is um, a really big thing in comic books. It's kind of how things go in comic books and uh in, in any really any um fandom type of media canon is um a really big thing so it was cool to see them uh, have that um be the explanation for what happens and you know they they talk about how a uh, captain always dies and they show ta our andrew garfield with captain stacy they talk about how these things make spider-man who they are the Spider-Man who they are, and they show um, they show Uncle Ben dying with uh, to with Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, and they show Tom Holland with Aunt May dying, and so the cameos, while they were kind of all they were part fan service, they also served a narrative purpose, and so I think that when you can do that with your cameos, not just throw things at the screen and be like, look at this, look at this, look at this, this you remember this, remember that. Uh, when it actually has, serves a narrative purpose, it um, makes the cameos better and makes them not feel like cameos or fan service. Um, and so I thought that was a really great way to incorporate the other Spider-Man characters and mythos into the multiverse. And, you know, Spot, in speaking of talking about the multiverse, Spot, go with who I didn't even talk about, Spot is a really great villain. Uh, Spot's kind of a jokey character in the comic books, but they did a really good job of developing him from this joke into an actual serious multiverse threat, um, which is one of the more scarier villains that we've had in comic books in a while. Um, they did a really great job of um, they did a really good job of this character and his power set and making him feel menacing. Uh, but uh, and you know it was funny they called back to, from the first movie into the Spider Verse. How uh, Miguel threw, or not Miguel, Miles threw that bagel at the scientist. And if you go back and watch the movie, you can see <laughs> the him throw the bagel at the scientist. But they were all coming after him with guns. So I think he left that part of the story out. You know, <laughs> when people tell their story, they kind of leave things out. But, um, you know, Spot was a really great villain in this. And uh, the Spot, speaking of the multiverse, when he takes his holes to different places, uh, he goes to the Venom verse as well, so they even had that Venom cameo with um I forget her name, but the convenience store uh clerk, um, and uh he, she's not surprised at all because you know she lives in the Venom verse, which has all these crazy things happen, <laughs> and she's seen you know Venom and all that, so she's not surprised by this multiversal being popping out of a hole. <laughs> so yeah, so things like that could feel like fan service and cameos, but. They saw that everything served a narrative purpose, and I thought it was done really well. Um, which again, not to rag on Multiverse of Madness again, but I really wish that Multiverse of Madness would have done something like this. Um, you know, have things serve a narrative purpose, because uh, I really think that benefits the movie. So, what did you think of Spider Man Across the Spider Verse? Do you think it's one of the greatest comic book movies of all time? I certainly think so, and I see a lot of people online think the same thing. But let me know down in the comments below what you thought of the movie. Who was your favorite, uh, you know, Spider-Verse character? And are you looking forward to Beyond the Spider-Verse? Um, what characters are you looking forward to in that movie? Let me know down in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe to the video for more comic book related talk. And I will see y'all another day.